Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Katya Kudryatseva and I'm a curator of Bloomner at Stetson exhibition History. Um, I would like to start with acknowledgements. First of all, I would like to thank um, the first curator of Bloomner collection at Stetson, uh, Dr. Roberta Pavis, for her incredible intellectual kindness um, and sharing her experience as the curator. I would like to thank the former director of Hand the Art Center, uh, Tonya Kripp, for encouraging me to take risks and actually start curatorial experience. And I would like to thank my uh, colleagues, Dr. Michael Fowler and Dr. Danielle Zavlunov, for always supporting uh, my weird endeavors. I would like to thank the current director of the Hand Art Center, James Pearson, for uh, his incredible help over the winter break with framing and installation. So thank you all. Okay, so for everybody who is experiencing this exhibition virtually, we will do a gallery walk. Our narrative starts here. Uh, with a wall featuring, as you can see, three panels listing every single Oscar Blumner exhibition at Stetson. The number is 26. Actually, this is 28 exhibitions. So two um, shows that were created this year were uh, devoted to Blumner at Stetson. Institutional history and this exhibition history. So. 26 shows which are all represented on this what I call an eye wall because there is a huge eye located at the center of the wall and just looking at this wall we understand how much the curators of Stetson collection brought to the spectators right and we see this incredible labor of seeing, labor of looking at the diverse aspect of Oscar Blumner's creative practice. Here we actually just looking at all these multiple frames on the wall, we can kind of see in a very, very condensed way the visual experience that was prepared by curators of Oscar Blumner at Stetson. So we see different topics that were covered and also we see the variety of artworks and styles that were shown to the spectators. This wall features a panel devoted to Roberta Favis, the first curator, which lists her publications uh, on Oscar Blumner. So we have a photograph of beautiful Roberta and we have a cover of American Art magazine featuring a work from Stetson's Oscar Blumner collection. I'm especially happy that this work by Blumner is uh, featured here because it was a work that was put on the cover of the catalog, the published catalog of Oscar Blumner at Stetson, um, written and produced by Roberta. Then we have uh, several panels that uh, feature different approach to the practice of curation. We have um, images of exhibition posters produced by our student curators, as well as installation shots from an exhibition uh, which was an artistic collaboration between the contemporary artist, digital artist Madison Creech and Oscar Blumner. The last wall is called Blumner on the Road and it features multiple venues where Oscar Blumner's works from Stetson Collection uh, were exhibited. It features museums in Washington DC, a private uh, gallery in New York, and of course uh, a very prominent place is uh, dedicated to the works by Blumner that 
travel to Whitney Museum of American Art, uh, Oscar Blumner retrospective, which again was a very, very important show that cemented Oscar Blumner's legacy. It's also very important to remember that we didn't just get the artworks, we also got some archival materials. And so those archival materials um, exhibited in this cabinet uh, were shown at the Cezanne and American Modernist exhibition, uh, which was a traveling show. And as you can see, we see this uh, different catalogs that were highly, that were annotated by the artist. Again, highlighting the meticulous nature of his um, artistic practice. We also have several installation shots from exhibits that were curated by Dr. Favis at different venues other than Stetson. For example, we can see the exhibition Oscar Blumner's America, picturing Patterson, New Jersey, which was shown in Montclair Art Museum in New Jersey. And also Oscar Blumner highlights from the Vera Blumner Cuba collection, uh, which was mounted at Vera Beach Museum of Art. Now that we are done with the gallery walk of the exhibition, we will proceed to the gallery talk. So, this is an exhibition about exhibitions, right? Sounds a little bit redundant. Why do that, right? I mean, exhibition happened, they passed, so why bring it all up? Actually, I think it's very, very important because people coming to museum rarely realize that they are not standing in front of Warhol, Velasquez, or Blumner in our case, but actually what they're experiencing is a highly mediated thing, right? They are looking at the visual narrative that was created for them by a curator. And this is especially relevant to Oscar Blumner because most of the works that we have uh, here at Stetson, they are sketches for larger works. What that means, they actually were not really meant to be exhibited. And yet here we go, we exhibit them. So who is in charge of this process, of this process of selecting uh, the works and creating a particular narrative for the spectator. It's the curator. So then you're in a museum, again, you're never looking directly uh, at the works, right? Your uh, experience is guided and controlled. So I think it's very important to understand the role of the curator in preserving the legacy of a certain artist. Then Vera Blumner Kuba was thinking about the future of the collection. She actually had options. The collection was estimated at $2.6 million and she could have easily sold it, but she did not want to do that. She wanted her collection uh, to be at Stetson because she truly believed that Stetson as an institution could preserve the legacy of her artist father. And Stetson did exactly that. Well, Dr. Robert Smith uh, has a lot to do with this process. Then Stetson received the collection, this uh, multiple drawings and sketches. They were not really dated, they were not titled. So before putting anything on the walls, Roberta had to do a massive research. By the time we got the collection, there was only one monograph published on Oscar Blumner. Um, then you read the first checklist, you actually can see um, the thinking, the rationale behind the titles, behind the dating, as Roberta would be comparing particular sketches to the um, finished paintings that were published in this monograph, trying to figure out how to place those works. So this work alone 
was monumental. Then the Hand Art Center was built, uh, Roberta would be preparing two exhibitions a year. So each semester it would be new exhibition. And if you think about it, it's a very tricky proposition because you're mounting the exhibition uh, of works produced by singular artists. So on one hand, it's actually very great that you have this massive collection. On the other hand, it's very uh, difficult to keep up the interest of the spectators. According to the statistics, viewers spend about four seconds in front of an artwork, right, and they move on. Uh, Roberta had to come up with a visual narrative that would actually keep the viewers coming in every semester. Again, that was difficult to achieve. And so um, what she did each time she would um, provide the spectators with this visual and intellectual puzzle. Uh, Roberto often compared um, her labor as an art historian to that of a detective, right? So every time you are researching something, as if you are unraveling this detective story. And I love this comparison a lot, not only because I truly love detective stories, which are my guilty pleasure, but because I think it actually explains what an art historian does. Curating an exhibition, it's not about just placing something on the walls, right? It's about researching a very particular aspect of um, an artist's creative activity. So um, if we look at the panels that list Roberta's exhibits, and if we look at the titles, we actually see how with each new exhibit she would be introducing all these diverse works so for example like one year um, she did an exhibit um, that featured um, black and white drawings by Blumner which is um, a very bold move if you think about it because Blumner as you look at the works around you, are all about color, right? And then she did this like, you know, before that it was color, 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 and then you come to this exhibit and this is like a visual shock. You are looking at this absolutely gorgeous black and white drawings, but nonetheless black and white, right? So it's always this oscillation um, in order to show this very, very different aspects of um, Oscar Blumner. Roberta, as an art historian, was also very much interested not only in formal elements of the painting and color, lines, shapes, and so forth, but also in uh, social political context, right? So she always situated the works created by Blumner uh, in, um, as they were created in the United States in 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s. And uh, she actually uncovered how the social political situation also uh, shaped um, his visual language. I would be remiss if I uh, do not mention other curators of this collection. For example, one of the exhibits was curated by Dr. Susanna Eulis, who is a professor of German at Stetson and who traveled back to Germany and made a series of photographs that documented the location of early Blumner paintings, also creating this very interesting tension between the medium of painting and medium of photography and um, also showing the changes in the landscape. Um, after Roberta retired, we had two exhibitions that were curated by our magnificent, um, talented art history students. Abigail Ramsbottom created an exhibition uh, devoted to the study 
of Bloomner's Place in, within the art history canon. And Simone Coley devoted her exhibition to exploration of color theories by Bloomner. I've started this speech with quoting the monetary estimate of Oscar Blumner collection. So then we got this collection, I will repeat. It was estimated at $2.6 million. And if we look now, 10 works from that collection are estimated at a little bit over $3 million. So you can imagine the increase uh, in value. Art is a very interesting thing. On one hand, when we talk about art, we don't want to tarnish or sully it with the whole money work. On the other hand, I mean, art is a commodity, right? Like then we say art is priceless. Well, actually it's not. You know, it has monetary value. But of course, art is strange because it's not just the monetary value, it's the symbolic value as well that contributes to the increase of monetary value. Then people actually look at the prices. We have every reason to be proud of because our artist, Oscar Blumner, is actually quite an expensive artist as his larger oil paintings are traded at, uh, you know, from three to five million dollars, right? So how did it happen? Um, because then uh, Oscar Blumner committed suicide. There was like several decades then people were not writing about his art and even though his works were already in the collections of major museums, still he was not uh, considered, like his status was not as high as now. Well, symbolic value, we don't exactly know how it happens, but we do know that exhibitions do contribute to the symbolic value. And so um, do the publications in academic and um, more popular art journals. So in that sense, uh, Roberta did a lot as the first curator of the collection, not only by preparing Blumner's work, works uh, for the exhibition, researching them, but also by publishing in very prestigious art magazines and also establishing connections with other museums. So Blumner's works from Stetson could be seen in other multiple venues. And as you are looking at these works, uh, as you are looking at the exhibition posters, and even if you don't believe in the importance of aesthetics, at least you will believe in monetary value. Everything on campus depreciates, except for the art of Oscar Blumner. <laughs>